shot by two men in a Prius. Hired a hitman. Prosecutor is laying it out so incredibly clearly. Erased from their lives. Nailed her. I don't know these people at all. The state does not know what happened. The Charlie Adelson's sister, Wendy, was in a pretty tough custody battle. She'd already kind of started working through the divorce and then it's, what are we gonna do with the kids? Well, at the time, she and her husband, Dan, they had shared custody of the children, but Wendy just really wanted to move from Tallahassee to South Florida. I mean, it's still Florida. It's not like you're even crossing state lines. This posed a problem for their shared custody situation. Wendy didn't want to deal with it. And she spoke with her brother, Charlie, quite a bit about it. And Charlie, his mom, Wendy, and maybe some other co-conspirators that you'll hear about in the opening statements, decided to come up with a plan. A grisly murder committed in broad daylight in a college community. Police struggled to piece together a puzzling crime. Who killed him and what was the motive? This case is interesting, the Charlie Adelson case, because at the time that I'm recording this, just four hours ago, the jury came back with a guilty verdict. But we're gonna go back and watch the trial from the prosecution's opening statements, the defense's opening statements, and then also, this is where it gets wild, Wendy, the ex-wife, her statement, about what was happening, a phone call that came from their mother, and then also Charlie, the guy that's on trial for possibly hiring the hitman, he tries to defend himself. He takes the stand. So this is gonna be kind of a long one, but I love to see the justice. I love to see a proper guilty verdict, but also I love to see a passionate prosecutor. <laughs> Shining justice. Shining justice. Let's get right to it. The reason that we're here today is because the defendant in this case, Charlie Adelson, there he is, hired a hitman to kill his former brother-in-law, Dan, Dan Markell. This murder was set into motion because back in 2014, the defendant's family, the Adelson family, had a big problem. Mm -hmm. And that big problem was Dan Markell. And the solution- I swear to God, if this man had looked directly into the camera as it was zooming in, I would have lost my mind because we've had a completely dystopian stream today. I wouldn't be able to handle it. This defendant was the solution to that problem because he had a girlfriend with connections to the type of people who were willing and capable of pointing a gun at a complete stranger and money. pulling the trigger. For money, yep. The victim in this case was known as Danny to his friends and family. Mm -hmm. He uh, was a loving father to two little boys. He was a highly respected professor at Florida State College of Law. Since we got the guilty verdict in, I'm allowed to say this. How much of a selfish ass piece of shit do you have to be to take your children's father away just because you don't want to drive too far. You don't like the way things are panning out. You don't want to do shared custody anymore. To take your children's father away from them? Oh my God, dude. That is so disgusting. Dan Markell was shot twice in the head in broad daylight in the driveway broad of his home daylight. in the Benton Hills neighborhood here in Tallahassee. The last day of Dan Markell's life that day began like any other of uh, his mornings that summer. He woke up, he drove his two little boys to preschool and dropped them off, and then he drove over to the gym to work out. Hmm. After finishing his workout, he returned home. He pulled in his driveway, oh my God. opened his garage, but little did he know that throughout his just normal, routine that morning mm. he was being followed oh my god he was being followed by two hired hitmen who traveled all the way from tele from miami to tallahassee for the sole purpose of murdering him how many of you guys went to the gym this morning or went to get groceries or went to pick up your kid from daycare those normal little things where we feel the most safe that is where they plan to kill dan his guard was completely down i would think in broad daylight when i'm coming back from the gym that i'm fine i'm safe i'm back at my apartment i'm in a parking lot like something about the broad daylight really gets me just like something out of a horror movie he pulls into his driveway and the car that unknown to him pulls in right behind him. 
Moments later, Dan Martell's neighbor heard a gunshot. He looked out the window and he saw a light colored Toyota Prius backing quickly out of Dan Martell's driveway and then speeding away. Got the car. The neighbor waited for a couple minutes to see if maybe Dan Markell came out of his house or backed out of his driveway too. And when nothing happened, this neighbor got that funny feeling that maybe something could be wrong here. He walked in the garage and saw that the driver's side window of Dan Markell's car was shattered. He was alive, but he was moaning. No. He was unresponsive and he was terribly injured. The neighbor then goes and calls 911. Law enforcement arrives and they find Dan Markell unresponsive with um, gunshot wounds to his head. He was then taken to the hospital where he survived for uh, several hours before oh he God. was actually pronounced dead. Don't um, try to look sympathetic now, you piece of shit. You organized it. They said he was guilty, so I could say that now. You organized it. Don't look sad. Don't look sad because you have to hear the details now of what you were involved with. His little boys that were deprived of their father that day were just three and four years old. Law enforcement immediately began to investigate to figure out who shot Dan Markell. Just wanna give a quick little round of applause here for a prosecutor that is laying it out so incredibly clearly what happened A to Z. She is doing a really fantastic job. Show, show, show easy for the jury to follow and it's it makes it difficult for the defense to poke holes in a story that makes complete sense and the evidence they find sets them down two separate paths one path is that they had to track down that light colored prius that the neighbor saw fleeing from the crime scene okay and identify who was inside that prius and the other path relates to dan markell's personal life they look to see who, if anybody, in Dan Markell's personal life would hate Dan Markell enough to kill him. And after years of tireless investigation by law enforcement, hmm. both of these two paths led directly to this defendant. Both paths so, led to him? Let's talk both about the path paths? involving Dan Markell's personal life first. In looking at who might have a motive to kill Dan Markell, law enforcement learned that Markell was entangled in a very nasty divorce mm. with his ex-wife, who is the defendant's sister. and Her name is Wendy Adelson. A review of their divorce case file revealed that Wendy Adelson asked the court to allow her to move back to Miami, where she was from, with the kids, in order to be near her parents, whose names are Harvey and Donna Adelson, Donna. and her brother, the defendant. Dan Markell was adamantly opposed to his children being relocated to Miami. Honestly, I'm, I'm nervous about raising kids in LA. I'd be nervous about sending my kids to Miami too. When I go to Miami, I'm there to party. I get it. For this and custody he didn't dispute, be separated from them. the judge ended up ruling in Dan Markell's favor. <gasps> Wendy Adelson was not permitted to move to Miami with the children. Oh, shit. Unless, of course, Something happened to Dan Markell. Oh my God. A review a of Wendy job. Adelson's emails revealed that her mother, Donna Adelson, hated Dan Markell. Oh, Don see, Donna's involved too. To find a way for Wendy and her children, who were Donna Adelson's grandchildren, to be able to move to Miami. Donna Adelson suggests in these emails that y'all will hear about several ways that Wendy Adelson could threaten or bully Dan Markell into submission, into getting what uh, she wanted him to do. Donna Adelson even suggested offering mm -hmm. Dan Markell a $1 million bribe to allow the relocation. Sorry, I'm just gonna say it. These motherfuckers think that they're the best parents, the best family for the job, that they need to get the kids away from Dan and that they should be living with them. However, you guys are one, 
able to kill the children's father and take their father away from them. You're not thinking about the children then and you're definitely not the better family then. Or two, can you imagine feeling like your dad left you from a very young age when you're four years old, but then later finding out that grandma bribed dad with a million dollars to go somewhere else and he took it. I would feel devastated. They do not have the children's best interest in mind. This is selfish. This is exactly why I called it the narcissistic family. This defendant, Charlie Adelson, would pay a third of that oh, million dollar bribe to Dan Markell to make that happen. The evidence in this case will show that Donna Adelson's closest confidant was her son, mm. the defendant. She and the Donna's defendant mom. talked multiple times a day, every day. He was the person with whom she would constantly vent and complain to about Wendy's situation. The defendant was also the person that Donna Adelson relied on to solve her problems. Mm. And this was a big, big problem for Donna Adelson. And she made it the defendant's problem to solve. The divorce between When's Wendy Donna's Adelson child? and Dan Markell was final about a year before the actual murder. But that was not the end of that case. Litigation was ongoing, to say the least. Each side would continue to routinely file violations of the custody agreement, violations of the settlement agreement, and that continued right up until Dan Markell's death in July of 2014. This was a highly emotionally charged situation between them leading up to his death. However, there was no physical violence that Wendy Adelson needed to be rescued from mm. or anything like that. But make no mistake, this was a very messy custody dispute. Family courts are brutal. I used to work at a law firm a couple years ago and there was this guy who was always very nice, very happy personality, but the, at the end of the day, he would just go dark. He would go dark and he was our family law attorney. And sometimes he would talk about the cases. It made him really sad how people could go from loving each other and taking their vows to saying the worst things about each other, throwing the, the biggest piles of mud. These cases like beat the light out of him. I don't know, family courts, I haven't had to deal with it, but it scares me, bro. It scares me. Shortly before the murder, in fact, Dan Markell, the victim, filed with the court um, and basically asked the court, he alleged that Donna Adelson was disparaging him to his children mm. by saying bad things about I him. I believe grandma was doing that. And he believe, asked the court. Y'all think grandma was doing that? She out here writing nasty emails to her son telling him, do something, you need to pay a portion of it. And you think she wasn't saying things to the children. To enter an order preventing Donna Adelson from having unsupervised contact with her grandchildren. This motion was still pending in court when Dan Markell was killed. The murder of Dan Markell ensured that an adverse ruling on his motion would never be a problem for the Adelsons. And just about 48 hours after the shooting, Wendy Adelson and the little boys relocated to Miami. Oh Shortly thereafter, moved into a home hours. within walking distance of the Adelsons' Miami home. Within a year of Dan Markell's murder, Wendy Adelson legally changed Dan Markell's son's last name from Markell to Adelson. Y'all done shocked me so hard, I'm over here making TikTok faces. You have to be dumb as dirt to think that you're gonna ask the courts if you can move the children from Tallahassee to Miami the courts tell you no and then just a few months later your ex-husband ends up dead in the driveway in broad daylight after being shot by two men in a Prius and you move to Miami 48 hours later it's almost like you knew it was gonna happen foreshadowing is a literary device and because I never heard of anybody being able to just move down to Miami in two days with a whole family unprepared you gotta be kidding I gotta know what the defense is gonna say. After. What's their defense? And the Adelson's family, their big problem had been solved. You'll hear during this trial that and the they Adelsons thought they were so smart it was gonna be over. Knit. The defendant and his parents, Harvey and Donna Adelson, they actually even all worked together, or worked together at the Adelson Institute, which was their family's dental practice. 
at the Adelson Institute, the defendant and Harvey Adelson were dentists and Donna Adelson managed the office. Wow. After Dan Markell was killed on July 18, 2014, law enforcement interviewed Wendy Adelson. And Wendy Adelson acknowledged that That's her family point. had a motive to kill Dan Markell or to want him dead. She admitted that her brother, the defendant, had even said that he looked into hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell as a divorce to present to her. But he decided to buy her a TV instead because it was cheaper. And coincidentally or not, that TV that this defendant bought his sister as a divorce gift instead, instead of hiring a hitman would be Wendy Adelson's alibi. So this path of looking into Dan Markell's life to see who would have a motive to want him dead leads law enforcement to the Adelsons, including this defendant, a man who told his family that he'd looked into hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell. The defense asked yesterday in jury selection, you know, who's talked trash or heard somebody talk trash <laughs> about an in-law, which is not a rare concept. A lot of people don't like their in-laws. But the difference here is that the defendant's comment stopped being just a little bit of trash talk hmm. when Dan Markell was actually killed by a hitman. While the police are trying to investigate who in Dan Markell's personal life may have a motive to kill him, they're simultaneously going down that second path I described to y'all, which was tracking down the vehicle that the neighbor saw fleeing the crime scene. When law enforcement retraced Dan Markell's steps the morning of the murder, they uncovered some chilling surveillance video chilling. of a Prius fitting the description of the one seen by the neighbor following Dan Markell into the premier gym parking lot, waiting for an hour while he was inside, they caught him and then following him. him home from premier gym back to his neighborhood. They got this, these surveillance images from city buses, from Premier, from everywhere they possibly could. And these surveillance images coupled with a massive amount of phone data and sun pass records gathered in this case helped police to eventually tra What's a sun pass? track down the exact car used in this crime. But police still Wait, had to they, figure man, out who was in the Prius and why did they kill Dan Markell? As part of this really painstaking review that law enforcement did of, of all of these records, and when I say painstaking, finding this Prius and finding this, these, all of this evidence and all of these records was not an easy task, and it took longer than your average investigation. It was very difficult to do. They combed through tons of phone records and even did um, what's called a tower dump, tower which dump. is where law enforcement collected a list of all of the cell phone numbers that communicated with the cell tower oh. that serviced different spots in Tallahassee That's that gotta be millions. that morning. That is a forensic tool I haven't heard of yet. A tower dump. They're just going to take every single phone number and see what lines up. They were not playing around. I'm here for it. If the person in the Prius was using their phone at the time, then their number will be somewhere in this tower dump. Yes. They tower combed dump. through all of that data and they found a number with a Miami area code oh. belonging to a man named Sigfredo Garcia. Ah. Law enforcement examined all of Garcia's call logs and saw that he was in frequent contact no mercy. with another number no that was mercy. also present at Premier Gym that morning. Ooh, you guys know I love good police work. I love it. I'm getting a little too excited right now. Tower dump! And that number belonged to a man named Luis Rivera. Luis! Luis Rivera is a lifelong friend of Sigfredo Garcia. Gripping the gavel. And is also from Miami. Police then looked at all of Garcia and Rivera's phone records, which showed that their phones left Miami about two, or two days before this murder mm -hmm. on July 16th of 2014. The phones came to Tallahassee, 
And on the day of the murder, July 18th, they followed Markel to Premier Gym. The phone data is consistent with both men turning off their phones <gasps> just minutes before the murder and leaving their phones off until about an hour or so after the murder when they're well on their way back towards Miami. And then a bank's ATM camera caught both Garcia and Rivera oh in that light-colored Prius once they arrived back in the Miami area when they stopped at an ATM. What do you have to say for yourself? Love how she laid that out so clearly. Like I said, it makes it hard for the defense to poke holes in that. It's going to be hard to convince me otherwise, okay? I love that they thought they were so smart by turning their phones off right before the murder, but the police station just said, well, let's get a tower dump, let's control F, and then just find the Miami area codes. And they plucked them right out. And they said, what were y'all two doing? Y'all just on vacation together in Tallahassee. Her opening statement is over 50 minutes long. I'll probably link it in the description, but we'll watch a little bit more of hers. And then we got to see how the defense follows up with it. There's a lot to go through in this case. And I have to see those emails from Donna. He's he's so nervous. He's like, what is she about to show? Oh, police figured out the identity. And this should appear on the screens in front of you. Responsible for following and killing Dan Markell. Girl. <laughs> Luis Rivera, his nickname is Tato, and Sigfredo Garcia, his nickname is Tudo. But they continued to look for evidence of why this, why two seemingly random men came all the way to Tallahassee to kill a man. I literally just wrote this down. I'm titling this video, Prosecutor Drags Defendant Kicking and Screaming Through Evidence to Guilty Verdict. I can't get over it. Okay, I'm gonna calm it down. I'm calming it down. She but they've is never dragging met. them. You know, what or who is the connection between these killers and the victim? Well, phone records reveal that one of Sigfredo Garcia's most frequent contacts was a woman named Catherine Magbanua. Her nickname is Katie. Garcia and Catherine Magbanua have a long history wow. of an on-again, off-again relationship over the course of many years, and they actually share two kids in common. And lo and behold, when looking at the phone records, Catherine Magbanua is also one of the most frequent contacts of this defendant, Charlie Adelson. Law enforcement learned that at the time of Dan Markell's murder, this defendant was dating Catherine Magbanua. She was his girlfriend at the time. So Dan Markell was a problem that this defendant needed to solve for his family. Mm. The defendant was looking to hire a hitman to kill Dan Markell. Dan Markell ends up being killed by a hitman. And who ended up being the hitman? It was someone with a close relationship to this defendant's girlfriend. What kind of card is he The hitman was the father of his girlfriend's children. So you can see how both leads in this case, followed by investigators. Both of them charted paths to this defendant. Not only did looking into the motive lead law enforcement to the defendant because he wanted to hire someone to kill, to, uh, kill Dan Markell, but looking into the car, fleeing the scene, also led law enforcement to the defendant through his girlfriend at the time. So two different mm -hmm. investigations mm -hmm. arriving at the same conclusion. Law enforcement also tried to follow the money in this case. Oh. And that was a third way that the evidence in this case points to this defendant. Law enforcement reviewed bank records, employment records, DHSMV records of all of the suspects and saw that in the months after the homicide, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, and Catherine McBanawa all acquired some big ticket items. Rivera and Garcia both bought motorcycles <laughs> and cars. You're Catherine McBanawa got a breast augmentation surgery and later received a black Lexus sedan whose previous owner was Harvey Adelson. Take it in. Go ahead. And for you guys that were drawing or cooking or cleaning or doing something else, let me just repeat it for you. They followed the money 
to see if there were any big transfers that went to the three that were involved. And afterwards, the woman involved in the case, she got her boobs done. One of the guys, he ended up getting a motorcycle. The lady, she also ended up getting a car, a black Lexus afterwards, that was owned by the defendant's brother. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Catherine Magbanua's bank records were analyzed oh. and there was no check ever written or matching cash withdrawal for the car or the breast augmentation, which was paid for in cash. Bank record also reviewed, bank records uh, also showed rather that Catherine Mary Banois' account had a huge spike in cash deposits right around the time of the murder. Wow. She deposited more money into her account in the five weeks following the murder than in the entire previous year before the murder. This was during a time when there was no record of her being employed anywhere. Also, about two months after the murder, the defendant added Catherine McVanois to the payroll at the Adelson Institute. And she began receiving regular checks from their business account every two weeks. Wow. For two years after the murder. And this was despite the fact she did not work at the Adelson Institute. This is unbelievable. Money was talking, but what were the suspects saying? That's what law enforcement wanted to know. So, as they're examining the phone records in this case, they see a distinct pattern surrounding important events and dates in this case. The phone calls and they can't see the content, they can't hear the content of these calls in these phone records, but they see that the calls are occurring. And the phone calls always went from Donna Adelson to the defendant, then from the defendant to Catherine Magbanois, then from Catherine Magbanois to Sigfredo Garcia, and back the other way. Kind of like train cars, they only touch the car right in front of them. You know. Donna Adelson never calls Catherine Magbanois hmm. or Sigfredo Garcia. Charlie Adelson never calls Sigfredo Garcia or vice versa. They thought they were so, so smart. So if this is a murder for hire, as law enforcement suspects, could it be that the defendant was wisely insulating himself from the actual shooters by having Catherine Magbanois act as a middleman between them. I have to see what the defense says. They actually put out a 50 minute statement. I don't know what the hell they were blabbing about for 50 minutes after that, but let's see what their reasoning is. If you guys were on the jury, would you be feeling pretty solid after that? I don't know what they're gonna say. Now let me start by saying the obvious. The murder of Professor Markell was a tragedy. The world lost a brilliant legal mind. His family lost a son and a brother. This community lost its sense of security and lost a good citizen. And his two boys, the nephews of Charlie Adelson, lost a loving father. I hate how he tries to connect them to Charlie by saying the nephews. But. His senseless murder continues to be felt throughout this community and others. It was inexcusable. I'm just gonna be a stickler here. Take it with a grain of salt. Inexcusable doesn't feel like the right word to use here if your client didn't do it. Does anyone else feel that way? That sounds like somebody did do it and you're saying inexcusable. Is I'm wrong about that one. I think he meant to use another word there. But what I'm going to tell you today is what actually happened. You will see that Charlie Adelson had nothing to do with the murder of Professor Markell. You will see that the state cannot come close to meeting its burden. Why? Because Charlie Adelson is innocent. Now, I don't have to prove innocence. What I'm telling you 
I very rarely say in a courtroom as a defense lawyer, Charlie Adelson is innocent. And we'll get there. I do not believe what you have said to be true. Chandler Halderson did not murder his parents. I would so watch a defense attorney mega compilation because they don't believe in themselves sometimes. But the next thing I'm going to tell you, I also rarely say in a courtroom. And you may be surprised to hear this from a defense lawyer. I have great respect for the prosecutors and law enforcement on this case. I have admiration for their efforts after the murder of Professor Markell in trying to find out who did it. You who will see it? that they spent countless man hours, cell phone tower dumps. Yeah, y'all y'all hated those those cell phone tower dumps and that ATM footage, huh? He's like, but I'm not defending them. I'm not defending those two guys. But I am defending Charlie. They got the three killers. So it was, he's saying it was them? Sigfredo Garcia, convicted for life. Luis Rivera, Catherine Magbanua, convicted for life. I'm already done listening to him. Like this is, this is like a troll. But he just said that the three people did do it. And Charlie was talking to Catherine. So I don't know how he's going to write that off. I don't understand. Problem is, as you just heard, the state saw no connection between these people and Professor Markell. So from the very outset, oh my God, he's the state sweating. suspected the Adelsons, the family. Yep. You saw the chart. Yep, they sure did. Makes total sense to me too. There had to be a middleman. Dan didn't know them. He didn't know these three people. So who was the connecting factor? Probably the family that was depositing money into their accounts and talking to them every other day. I don't know. It's crazy. It wasn't limited to Charlie Adelson. Unindicted co-conspirators in oh this case, the state has said it. I know that this is gonna be an integral part of the evidence or something, but just looking up here and seeing road range incident, first murder attempt, yard bird dinner. What is this chart? When I looked at the prosecutor's grid that she made of all the people involved, I said, there he is, he did it. This one, I'm like, what the f is this? This is like, when, when a liar has to take all of these situations and find a way to weave it together. I have learned if a liar wants to succeed, they can find a way to weave a whole bunch of things together. But the prosecutor's grid was so cut and dry. Wendy Adelson. The bump. Donna Adelson. Harvey Adelson. I can't, I, he, he's got two more minutes on the clock. The state knew, as you heard, that Wendy Adelson and Professor Markell had gone through a brutal divorce. And you're gonna see it. But they couldn't find the connection. But then they had their aha moment. As you heard, they determined that at the time of the murder in 2014, Charlie Adelson was dating Catherine McBannable. And they learned that Catherine McBanua had had a previous relationship on again, off again with Sigfredo Garcia. I thought they were gonna stay with Charlie. They learned that Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine McBanua shared two children together. They had their connection. The problem is that's where the state began to guess. There it is. That's his defense. He's saying that there's no proof. The state had to guess and they just slotted my client into this whole fiasco. He actually had nothing to do with it. Why did Wendy Adelson drive to Dan Markell's crime scene? What? She drove to his crime scene? She's the one that wanted to take the kids from Tallahassee to Miami and she did it just two days after his murder and then changed the children's last name to Adelson. 
did you go to the crime scene or very near the crime scene on no. your way from your residence to, I guess, to lunch or to wherever you were going next? No, I did not. So you never turned on Trescott Drive that day? I went to turn on Trescott Drive, but I saw that it had been blocked off by some tape. Well, you basically went to the crime scene then. If you if you drive to your exit street and you can't turn left because there's crime scene tape, th then you know. That's the equivalent of driving by your ex's house. Also, I don't fucking trust this lady. This is giving Elizabeth Holmes. This is the Theranos stare. She did the same exact thing in her deposition. The... When you, you had to turn around at the tape, right, to go back out. I think I tried to turn right and it couldn't turn, so I would have made like a, the kind of turn, like a K-turn and kept going. Was there a roadblock there with? There was tape. Yeah, and an officer was there. I didn't a... see an officer, but I did see a car. Not even curious about what's going on in that street, by the way. Oh so, my God, Benny! Um, that was I can't believe Benny just called her out like that. And he's saying this before the guilty verdict came in. This man knew. You know, right around the time of the murders or just after the murder of, of Dan Markell. So that's a big question. Was she going to visit the scene, make sure everything happened? Is that evidence uh, that she knew something here? I think it's interesting that they said, did you drive to your ex's house the day that he was murdered? And she said, no. She blatantly said no. But then when she goes into further detail, she was at the, the T intersection of the streets and she just didn't turn on his street because there was crime scene tape. She was there. Her full video taking the witness stand is a little bit longer, but here are some interesting moments from the redirect after the prosecution asks her questions and then they the defense comes around and then they come back over. The long list of plans that you went over with Mr. Rashbaum that you were gonna have in Tallahassee post murder date. None of those plans happened, right? No. Because you moved to South Florida, right? Because I felt unsafe to stay here, yes. And did you feel safe in South Florida? No. Did you buy a house in Tallahassee after the murder? No, I did not. Did you rent a house in Tallahassee after the murder? No, I didn't live in Tallahassee after the murder. Did the boys go to school that fall here in Tallahassee? No, all our plans were broken. What was the purpose of those questions? Of course you didn't. You moved to South Florida. You didn't have plans in Tallahassee if they got executed. Why, why were you asked about all those things? I, I don't know why I was asked questions by the defense counsel. That's your brother's team. So right here, the prosecution is calling out, why did they ask you all them dumb questions about living or renting in Tallahassee? Like, why why did you guys even set that up? And she's like, what are you talking about? Like, bro, you're playing for the defense. Don't act stupid. Book event that you were asked about, did that event happen? Uh, I didn't speak at the event, but the event still happened. Have you had several events re related to that book that have happened? I have. And what events were those? Um, do you mean just in Tallahassee or do you mean in other places? Everywhere. Um, I've spoken at various schools about human trafficking and about my book. Um, I think there was one event that still happened in Tallahassee about a year later. And was is that the only book you've written or have you written more than one book? I've only written one book. What was the book about? The book was about human trafficking and about the vulnerabilities that lead to trafficking, the problems when it occurs, and basically how to recover from it after. Where was the book set? It was set in a fictional town. What was the name of the fictional town? I don't Iowa. know what it is, but I really like this lady's demeanor. She doesn't believe a damn word she's saying. She's just like, mm-hmm. Tell me about the book. And where was the, what was the town the book was in? She's like a doctor. I like I like it. I like her energy. So Hiawassee. Is it located in the panhandle of Florida? No, I used to see the name when I was driving from Tallahassee to Orlando, so it's somewhere in between. And was the place modeled after Tallahassee? Hmm. It was definitely somewhere in Florida, but not supposed to be about so Tallahassee, she wrote a no. Book. Who was the central character in that book? So there's three central characters. One was one of my clients, kind of a composite character from Eastern Europe. One was um, kind of a composite character of many clients I've represented from Latin America. I don't know where she's going. And with one this. was a public interest lawyer. And was the public interest lawyer Lily? Yes. And is that the character that's sort of based after yourself? No, really more based after a friend of mine. 
and was Hiawassee, Florida, quote, just a small stop on the way back to what we had previously known as civilization? Is that a quote from your book? That sounds like a quote from my book, yeah. And who's the husband of Lily, the public interest lawyer? I, I, want- I just can't get over this. I don't know what the hell they're talking about, but I just feel like this lady is like a shark in the water that's just circling her right now. And I'm like waiting for her to get up and catch her. His name in the book? Yes. I think it was Josh Stone. All right, and what was Josh's employment? Josh was an English professor. It's been a while. I wrote the book over 10 years ago. I don't remember what I named the university in the North Florida State University. That sounds right. NFSU? NFSU sounds right, yeah. All right, and in the book, does Lily lament, quote, we moved to this godforsaken place for Josh's career? Yes, that sounds like a line Lily would say. All right. When you looked at page 187 of the divorce document on Cross, and I'll hand that back to you. Okay, the divorce document. Dude, hitmen trials are so interesting because sometimes you'll find out that the hitman was paid $1,000 or like $3,000. You're like, am I worth, my life is only worth $3,000? Here, they said that Catherine was getting a lot of checks directly from the Adelson's uh, dentistry office. And here, there's a little more details. It says prosecutors introduced $17,000 worth of checks signed by Donna that were made out to Catherine. They were willing to initially pay Dan a million dollars, but they probably paid, it looks like they probably paid the hitman like a a good couple tens of thousands of dollars to each of them. And she got breast implants. Do you see the quote that you read previously from that page? I don't. It had to do with, let's see if I can find it. That, That you were very unhappy in the marriage. I think it's the third paragraph there. I see that line. Okay, the wife has been very unhappy in the marriage and files her petition for dissolution of marriage in August 2012. The husband continues to characterize this as abandonment, and then it goes on to say that he had been disparaging you to some of the folks at at the law school. Do you remember reading that? I do. Was that intended to be the place in this binder where you allege emotional abuse? by your husband? I mean, I, I think it's emotionally abusive to suggest somebody has mental health issues. Well, how do you guys feel about it? Because my, my immediate thought is like, you know, if somebody five years ago were to like aggressively tell me that I had mental health problems, I would be like, that's f***ed up. Why would you say that? But I also was very sick. So <laughs> I actually don't know the answer to this one. I'm out, folks. What is the Prof's blog? You were asked about that on Cross. Yeah, it was um, it was a blog that Danny started with some of his colleagues um, to kind of promote community in the law profession. Dude, I'm sorry, I just have to say this. She just said, "What was the the cross squad?" And then she said, "Blog." But my my thought immediately went to like a David Dobrik like group of attorneys, the cross squad. <laughs> It's not funny, but I had to say it. Uh, my brain's off today, okay? What is the Prof's blog? You were asked about oh, that on Prof's cross. blog. I thought they yeah, said the it was, Cross um, squad. It was I'm, a blog I'm that out. Danny started right. with some of his colleagues um, to kind of promote community in the law professor world. And who reads the plof, Prof's? Probably prof's other, blog. other law professors and people interested in becoming law professors. Who is on the... Crim Prof List Serve. <laughs> the way she I reads it. Were you on the, I, on the. Okay, hear me out, folks. Is it just me, or does it feel like the way that this person from the prosecution's team is presenting her questions is almost set up to make Wendy feel uncomfortable? Just to feel like she doesn't believe her. Because This prosecutor sounds so disinterested, so like something's coming. There's a sense of uneasiness with everything she's asking. It's like when you when you go into the details, you're like, what is she trying to say? But the delivery and the everything, I'm like, if I were Wendy, I would be incredibly uneasy right now. And it feels like a tactic to me. I'm eating it up in a way. On the law list serve. I don't know. Were you on the on the listserv for that prof's blog? I, I may have been on the listserv at some point. 
Do you remember seeing the post that you were shown on cross? I do. The post says something about Danny and I are planning to attend a conference that will begin Sunday, July 20th. Is there any other information on what you were shown about Dan's travel plans post-murder other than that? I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? The post says Danny and I, I guess it's another professor writing this thing, Danny and I are planning to attend a conference that will begin Sunday, July 20th. Is that the type of information that's, that he would typically have on something like the Prof's blog or Facebook? That sounds right. Okay, but as far as the date he's leaving, the flight he's on, that kind of stuff, would that typically be on the Prof's blog? I don't, he, oh my gosh, I don't know how I missed this. Charlie's girlfriend was Catherine. I did know that, but it hadn't fully sunk in. So if you feel like that kind of got glazed over in the case, Catherine is Charlie's girlfriend. They're saying that she was paid $100,000 for this hit. He wouldn't put what flight number he was on, but he would, almost always communicate when he was going on a trip. Okay, so going to a conference that starts July 20th might be an example. Flying to New York tomorrow would be an example. Okay, but, but he not, didn't not put, a flight number. But he didn't put flying to New York tomorrow in this, on this occasion. No. You were referenced several times, not on direct examination by the state, but by your brother's attorney on cross as a co-conspirator. Are you charged in this case? No. This isn't your trial, is it? No. Is your brother charged with conspiring with you to do a murder? No. Is he charged with conspiring with you to plan a murder? No. Is he charged with soliciting you to do a murder? No. Who is he charged with doing those things with? No, I don't think anyone. Have you had an opportunity what? to review his indictment in this case? I have not. opportunity to take a look at that document to yourself. Oh, oh, yeah. Mm. I know some of these words. Who is your brother alleged to have done these crimes with? Catherine D. Magbanawa. Were you on the wire in this case, Ms. Adelson? No. So when the bump happened, are you familiar with the event I'm referencing? What as is the, the bump? bump? I am now. When law enforcement approached your mother on the street and handed her a piece of paper? Yes. Okay, when that occurred, who did your mother call? I don't know. Not you, right? Not me. Okay, and once your brother found out about the bump, did he call you about it? No. Who did he call? I don't know. Well, you listened to the calls to authenticate the voices, didn't you? Just, just to hear the voices, not to hear the content of the calls. Okay, and the voices were mm -hmm. your brother's voice, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I listened to the calls just to hear who was on them, so I don't know what content they're referencing. I heard your answer. My question to you now is your brother's voice was on the calls. I love her. New type of attorney unlocked. Sassy, judgmental, disappointed. I just can't get over how shocked I am that it's it's so subtle, but I'm just eating up every word she says. I heard your answer. My question to you now is your brother's voice was on the calls. He was on some of the calls I listened to. Okay. Your mother's voice was on the calls. She was on some of the calls I listened to. And it's your ex-husband, dumb <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Wendy, how are you gonna sit here and say that you're not involved at all and I don't know what's going on right now when it's your fucking <laughs> ex-husband that was killed? Bruh, your mom and your brother are talking trash on your ex-husband and you're not involved? Like, what? You were asked about Jeffrey Lacoste and the way that your relationship ended. What is OkCupid? Hmm? OkCupid is a dating website. Were you on that dating website? Uh, I was. Were you on that dating website at the time that you were dating Mr. Lacoste? No, I wasn't. And were you speaking, so I guess if you weren't on it, you weren't speaking to multiple men from the website oh. during the time you were dating Mr. Oclaus. And I'll remind you that you provided your phone in this case and it was celebrated. Oh my God. Downloaded. Objection. Yeah, object that. <laughs> Prosecutor giving her a strong warning not to lie. Ah! Saying we've got the evidence. And wait, let's just back the truck up for a minute. Back here. it up. Wendy Adelson is the lawyer of the Adelson family and just said under oath that she never reviewed her dentist brother's indictment. 
We're going to hit a break. Don't go anywhere. There's okay. much more to come from the prosecution. We won't. Right I love the court TV quips. Florida oh prosecutors God. are setting their sights on Charlie Adelson. Three people have already been convicted for their role. Yeah, in the dude. And, and here's the thing. If they convict Charlie, which he has now been found guilty, Charlie's conviction drags the whole family down with him. I mean, obviously he's the one that orchestrated it, but he is the link between Catherine, between Wendy, between Donna. If they just got Donna, they may not get Charlie and Wendy. If they just got Wendy, they may not get Charlie and Catherine. So Charlie brings the whole motherfucking house down. Do you want the culpable parties held accountable for murdering the father of your children? Yep. Absolutely. I'm grateful they're already in jail. But not if it's your family. It's not my family. I mean, somebody hired him, right? Oh. Not necessarily. Somebody paid him. I learned something this morning. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Dude, her face to... after that. She is pissed. Didn't you tell law enforcement that? That's not what I told law enforcement. What did you tell law enforcement? I told them that the person who did this should be held responsible and that I had nothing to do with it. I listen, I'm not a body language guy, but her posture, she looks very aggressive here. She's not on the defense. She's on the attack right here, or she's ready to attack. You know, and look, you don't have to be a body language expert to pick up on that. She looks aggressive right there. And her posture looks so like relaxed, so in control. They should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law <laughs> the investigator says regardless of who it is and your answer is i mean it would be different if i thought it were my brother but i don't think it was my family it's what different I now isn't it no it's not different that's exactly it's different what today I said isn't right it? here no that's not no right. further questions oh. Oh. Ah! Ah! didn't you just say that you weren't on okay cupid at the time that you were dating jeffrey lacoste I don't know when we say I officially stopped dating Jeff Lacasse, but there's a chance that, I mean, I, I don't remember in 2014 whether I had gotten the app and started talking to people before we officially broke up. Okay, so my point is there's a chance that he was right. You oh. were. She was monkey barring it, dude. That's what she was doing. She got one hand on the monkey bar back here, swinging, trying to grab onto another one with both hands. Still dating him, and she was on OK Cupid. Okay, so my point is, there's a chance that he was right. You were being unfaithful, or at least talking to other people. He had a reason to be jealous. I think he had some serious jealousy issues that may or may not have been founded. Yeah, I think we got from your testimony that you believe he had serious jealousy issues. My question to you is, did he have a reason to be? No. So he was wrong. He was wrong in June when he accused me of being with multiple people that I wasn't with, yes. Okay. What was wrong with Dan's mother trying to make arrangements for the kids in the event of your arrest? In the event of her arrest, what was wrong with Dan, the victim, trying to make arrangements for the kids? Which obviously she didn't want Dan or Dan's family to have any part of what happened to, which she perceived as her children, but they were also Dan's kids. Wasn't that a kind thing to do? I don't think it's kind to put my children in foster care. Wasn't the foster care intended only to cover the time frame that it would take for her to get on a plane and get here? She never said that. You thought she was just going to leave them in foster care? I didn't know what to think. They have a mother. They don't need to be in foster care. But they wouldn't have a mother in the event of your arrest, Ms. Adelson. Wasn't that the intention of the email? I don't know what the intent of the email was. There's no, I was not going to be arrested for a crime I didn't commit. But you, you <laughs> wasn't, would be involved. She didn't know that, though, did she? I, I don't know what she knows or doesn't know. I can't speak Does, to that. Do Dan's parents know whether you committed this crime or not? I don't know how to answer that question. How would they? Particularly back at the time that she sent that email. It was fresh at that time, right? I'm sorry, what was fresh? The, all the events that were occurring, the arrests. That was two years after Danny's murder. I don't know what she knew or didn't know. I know that my children don't belong in foster care. It is so interesting seeing a whole family in cahoots together on a murder trial all play stupid. And don't forget, after this, we're going to be listening to apparently the mother, Donna's crazy call that sealed the deal on a lot of things here. Was it a 
specific foster care that she was requesting be called in the event that the children had no place to go and were going to be going into the custody of the state. She did suggest a specific foster care agency. A Jewish run foster care agency. A Jewish foster care. Okay. How many times have the kids visited Dan's parents since this murder? Great question. Many. It can be hard to count. Countless times? Countless times. That's all the answers she How was many expecting. times have they seen her in the last year? Um, we had a visit with Danny's dad and his, the boy's cousin this summer. We had, we've had a lot of Skype visits. They do live in Canada, so it makes mm -hmm. it a little bit harder to have in-person visitation. But every time they've asked for it, we've arranged it. Every time they've asked for an, a visit, you've arranged it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, she better get it. How many times have they seen him in the last five years? I love this lady. Again. We Countless? Had, as in the last five years, that overlaps with the time when they tried to put them in foster care. So since we've established, since we've reestablished relations, we've seen them about twice a year whenever they come down to Florida. So in the last five years, they've seen them how many times? Two or three times a year? about that. Has this been a major issue between you and Dan Markell's parents, this issue of them having access to the kids? The issue of them trying to put them in foster care is a major issue. No, ma'am, yes. that's not my question. I'm sorry. Has, hasn't the issue of them trying to get access to your kids been a major issue, mm. at least for them? Since they tried to put the children in foster care, yes. Before that, it was not a problem. Her saying that is really stupid because if you put Dan's parents on the stand, oh my God, especially with the jury, if they're older people, if they're sad because they haven't seen their children, they're sad because their son has been taken from them at, at the age of 40. You think at 40 that he's safe, he's made it, you know? You put those parents on the stand and they refute that and say, we never get to see our kids. And it's not because we live in Canada. She just makes it difficult for us. Now she's going to look like a liar. You, you have two people that can refute that. She's going to look real bad up there on the stage. It's going to destroy her credibility almost immediately. Are you familiar with their work across the street at the legislature trying to get bills passed to give grandparents rights to see kids? I'm familiar with their grandparents' legislation, but it's actually unconstitutional. Are you mad? Are you, are you angry that according to your brother's theory, he and your mom have known who killed your children's father since 2014, and you weren't told who it was? Oh. I'm more angry that somebody killed my children's father. She had so that you're not mad ago. about that, that they knew this whole time. That's what they're saying. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? That's the theory of the defense in this case, is that, they, that he's known the whole time. Your brother's known what happened to Dan. Does that make you angry? I'm angry about so many things, it's hard to Is that one of oh. them. Oh, boy. We'll try. I'm confused. According to his lawyer, these killers had threatened to kill your brother's family members as well. Did you hear that? I did hear that. And that would be you, right? It would. Were you told that a specific threat had been made by the same people that had killed your ex-husband to kill your brother's family members. I was not told. Would that have been information you would have liked to know back in 2014? Oh my God. Yes. Would Dude. you have made the same decision to move down to South Florida closer to the killers? No, I would not. Oh, oh. And even after oh. the killers were arrested in 2016, you weren't told that that's what was going on oh the whole God. time. I found out yesterday. You. <laughs> Friendly reminder, folks, this was recorded uh, uh, 10 days from the time that I'm recording this right now. She is claiming that for, for what, seven years, she didn't know who the killers were, even though they were arrested and being investigated. She just found out yesterday. No further questions. No further questions. She got her. Dude. She said she, she got, got her good on that question where mm. she said what everybody's wondering about. Mm. Will Wendy Adelson be arrested when she asked the question about foster care for the kids in the event of her arrest? 
nailed her right there and she knew it too guys we're not done we're still on this case because we need to find out what's going on with donna the mother or should i say the matriarch damning phone call between donna and undercover cop donna what did you do In the last video, we listened to a call between Donna and an undercover officer where they kind of had this sting operation that was called the bump. We were able to like pick up fragments of what the bump was in the call, but I wanted to go back to the prosecution's opening statement where they explain a little bit more in detail what Operation The Bump was. Thank so you. all of the members of this conspiracy have presumably gone on with their lives believing they've gotten away with this murder. So even though law enforcement has authority to listen to their calls now, you know, what are they going what reason would these people have to still be discussing the murder at this point? Hmm. So, police needed to stage an event <laughs> that would generate conversation between the conspirators about the murder. And the plan was to send an undercover agent posing as somebody on behalf of Luis Rivera, who was incarcerated, to walk up to Donna Adelson on the street and try to extort money out of her. Ooh. And law enforcement refers to this uh, as the bump. So this undercover agent walks up to Donna Adelson one day as she's leaving the Adelson Institute during the day the undercover agent hands Donna Adelson a piece of paper. Oh. And on the piece of paper oh. is an article about the murder of Dan Markell. Oh my God. Picture on it oh. and, you know, FSU professor killed. Um, also on the piece of paper are a phone number and the amount of $5,000. The undercover agent tells Donna Adelson that he knows that the Adelsons are taking care of Katie and he's there to extort money out of her on Rivera's behalf in order to even things out. The undercover agent never says the defendant's name or anything about the defendant's involvement to Donna Adelson. Then law enforcement listens to see what will happen next. Hmm. Will Donna Adelson go straight to the police to report this extortion attempt, or will something I, I else gone straight to the police. entirely yeah. happen? As suspected, based on the previously observed communication pattern, the first person that Donna Adelson calls after the bump is the defendant. She called Tony. Despite the fact that the undercover agent never mentioned the defendant to her. On that first call, one would think that Donna Adelson would say to her son, you know, it's so crazy. Some man came up to me and he's handed me this article about Danny's murder. And he's, he's, you know, seems like he's demanding money from us. She never says any of that. In fact, she never says Dan Markell's name at all. Instead, hmm. she tells the defendant that she needs to talk to him in person, in person, not over the phone about some paperwork that was hand delivered to her. She said that this paperwork, she says this to the defendant, it involves the two of us and that he should know what she's talking about. Donna said to Charlie that it involves the two of us. She says that he should bring cash to their meeting. And she also says that this TV is about five. Donna Adelson tells the defendant that the man who approached her mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Donna Adelson never says which ex-girlfriend she's referring to. Hmm. She never says Catherine Magbanwa or Katie's name hmm. to the defendant in that phone call. She only says that the blackmailer mentioned an ex-girlfriend. The defendant never asked his mom. What are you talking who's about? Who's ex my ex-girlfriend? Which ex-girlfriend? He doesn't sound confused. Probably didn't sound confused. He sounded concerned. Big red flag. He knew that this TV is about five. 
meant that she was being blackmailed about Danny's murder for 5000 And he knew that the ex-girlfriend in question was Catherine Mabanois. Mm. And we know that because after this call with his mother, the defendant calls Catherine Magbanois. Ah! He doesn't call his most recent ex-girlfriend. He doesn't even call ah, ah. the most recent ex-girlfriend because before the most recent You're ex-girlfriend. The one before me. that. No, he calls Catherine Magbanois. He calls her right up. And his call to Catherine Magbanois is the only call that he makes only to call. any ex-girlfriend. After getting the information from his mother that the blackmailer mentioned an ex-girlfriend. And he had not dated Catherine McBanwell for a year and a half at that point. Oh my god. And although the defendant threatens to do it often, (laughs) neither he nor his mom ever report the matter to the police. The only people that he discusses it with in these calls is Donna Adelson and Catherine McBanwell. Yep. And you'll hear these phone calls between the conspirators. Oh, yeah, I heard it. And as you listen to these calls, y'all will notice that they are being cautious about what they say in, over the phone. Donna, what did you do? This is Mrs. Adelson. Oh, my <laughs> God. Bro, <laughs> she on the phone with the undercover cop, and she starts off by saying, this is Mrs. Adelson. Just throw out the part in the courtroom where they were like, can you confirm this is Donna? She can't deny it. She states her name in the beginning of the call. You, you left a message on my, on my voicemail. Right, I did. This is the cop, I think. No. <coughs> Hello? Yeah, this is Mrs. Adelson. Yeah, this is Mrs. Adelson. You approached me on Holton Road. You handed me an article from the newspaper about my ex-son-in-law. You told me I need to call you and help your friend who was in prison. Now, at the time you did that, I didn't understand what you were talking about. I didn't call you back. Then you mail me a threatening letter. Hmm. Then you send me a text message to my phone. I'll say this. I don't know what she's going to say yet next, but based off of the details she's giving and the tone, she is heavily involved in this and she's nervous about something and she's trying to distance herself from it. I don't even know the full context of what she's trying to say, but you, you can hear in her voice that she's way too involved. She is way closer to this murder than somebody's mom should be. And says, I'm not taking you seriously. So... I am taking you seriously, and I really should want you to listen to me. I, I, listen. I have to tell you, I mean, this is important. I, I have been so stressed out. I have spoken to 10 or 12 people who are close friends of mine, telling them about this and basically picking their brains and asking them what I should do because... I don't know your friend who is in jail. I don't, I, you, you mentioned a name. I don't even know his name. I never spoke to him. I don't know what he looks like. I've never met him. I, I'm sorry your friend's in jail, but I don't know what that has to do with me. Do, do, you, you, know, you know exactly what it has to do with it. You, uh, you know exactly what it has to do with Listen to me carefully. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. Oh. You just gotta listen to me. You need to you ask gotta, your friend yeah. who this person looks like, what their name is, something, because I know there's a big reward out there, and if you need money for your friends, oh. that's the way to get it. Oh. I mean, I'm asking you nicely. Oh. I don't know who he is. I am out of the loop. It is not me. If I can help, I would help. I mean, I, I, that's what just like I, I told, just like I told you. Listen to me. Just like I told you that day, we know what we know that that your family had a problem up north. We know that that problem was taken care of about a year and a half, two years ago, and we know that Katie has been taken care of. It has been taken care of. No, no. Okay, got it. He's basically calling them and pretending like he's got some dirt on her to see what she says and how she responds. And my brother took care of me about a year and a half, two years ago. And we know that Katie has been taken care of. It has been okay. taken care of. Now, now my brother, my brother in, in jail, he, we were in Broward together. He told me the whole ah. thing. 
and he hasn't been taken care of. Oh my god, holy f Okay, so they call this old woman and they pretty much say that the person on the phone calling is, and they started off, I guess, it was this the bump? So he contacts her first in person. And then when she calls, he's basically saying, my friend that did the hit, he hasn't been taken care of yet. And I fucking know everything. And Donna's like, whoa, 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 Mr. Hitman. Like, I'm not involved at all. And he's like, yeah, well, you already took care of Catherine. I know you took care of Catherine, which she did. She already sent money over. And now he's like, now you need to take care of my friend. He he hasn't he hasn't gotten anything. And Donna's like, I don't know these people at all. But if anything, this is going to make her so uneasy. And she's she's going to slip. She's going to slip in some way or... I mean, obviously, we got this call, which just doesn't sound believable at all. All, 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 we're, all, all that's being asked for is five, 5K. That's all we're asking for is for 5K. Pull. So if Donna gets scared enough to send the money, that's pretty damning. Now, I mean, I guess she could go back and say, hey, I was scared. We have the money. We just wanted to send it so these people would leave us alone. She could say that. But for the police, that would be pretty gnarly if she handed that money over. You know, I'm My whole answer is to send the 5K. Everybody knows what's going on. I don't, you know, you're saying everyone knows. I know I lost my ex-son-in-law. I did not have anything <laughs> to do with it. That's why I said, ask him what... That's, that's what, that's not, that's not, that's what not my, my brother Tato told me. He told me everything when we were in jail. He told me everything <clears throat> and who was involved. I know everything. Well, I don't. That's the problem. I'm She's trying so hard. It's not me. Not me. I am having a year of aggravation, a year and a half of aggravation over this. My my daughter, my grandchildren. It is not me. And when I asked my friends, what do they think? They said, well, this person needs to get a description of you because of what you look like. Or oh my God. it's not me. I don't know who caused this. It wasn't me. I will say, you know, if they had gotten a different person to vo voice this and they sounded a little more intimidating, they if they sounded like some heat that Donna didn't want to deal with, they might have got a different answer. But the person on the phone sounds like he looks like this guy. <laughs> but I'm going to just say, put a black man on the phone. Donna would have got scared real fast. This is a great tactic and obviously they got something out of it. But I, I mean, straight up, that we would have got way more results out of that. Donna would have blasted a hole through her pants. <laughs> If you, you had a black man on the phone and she's like, ah, I'll send the money right now. Here's extra. Do you know that they took care of Katie and her people? Nobody's taking care of Tato. You, I know you don't know who Tato is. No, I don't. But we know, we know who all of you Look, are. Look, even, even just a name that she couldn't tell the person's ethnicity, she freaked out a little bit there. What did he say, Tato? And then she said, well, I, 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 I. <laughs> Here's what you need to do. You need to go and... Don't, I don't tell me what to do. I know what to do and I'm doing it. You're looking for money. Get a hundred thousand dollars or whatever the, the, what do you call it? Whatever the reward. She said you got a hundred thousand dollars. Almost like in the way somebody would say it if they just gave it to you. Like, dude, come on. I just gave you 20 bucks. Like, and obviously I'm making some assumptions here, but like that is what I hear. It's so interesting. Yes. This is not going to happen. I mean, if you want the money, you should get it from the police. They can give you a whole lot more than than, than you're asking me for money for someone. I I, I just I, I can't I can't do this. I have had too much stress and too much aggravation from this, and I don't know what you are talking too deep. about. I just don't know. I just don't know. Good. I think you should talk to Katie. Talk to talk to people that are involved in this. Question for you. Does Donna sound like someone that didn't do it? Or does Donna sound like somebody that doesn't want to get in trouble? Not looking good for them. Okay, Charlie, let's put him on the stand. This is Charlie's defense team. They're not trying to go hard on him. I wanted things to stay the way they were from when we just started dating. Now, if you turn to defense exhibit 36, Text messages from February 5th, 2014. 2014, mm -hmm. so this is before? 
What is she asking you? What does she start by asking you about? And you Hold don't on. have to read Sorry. it. Sorry, we need to know. Text messages from February 5th, 2014. This is before the murders, right? It was in July. So these messages are from before. What is she asking you? What does she start by asking you about? And you don't have to read it. Just tell the jury generally what she's asking you about. What is she concerned about? She's asking if I'm talking to a bunch of other girls. Oh. And what do you tell her in response really? generally? I, I say, no, I'm not. And again, in this text message, she's asking you whether, she's telling you that she wants more, right? Yeah. And how do you respond? Um, I ask her, are you thinking about getting back with your ex? Okay, so Catherine over here, it says she was raised in South Miami. She worked office jobs and as a bottle girl at nightclubs. She and Charlie dated in 2013, and then it sounds like by 2014, they were either broken up or on the rocks. I say you're the coolest and most fun girl that I'm always happy when I'm around. And then I said, I know it's, it's not easy, and I think we're doing a good job at not rushing things. Oh. So. And what were you oh. trying to tell Ms. Magdanawa in this text message? I was trying to say, I, I like you and I have a good time hanging out with you, but I don't want to rush things. Now, Moving to text messages in March of 2014. Ms. McBanawa texts you, you've mentioned me to your mom. Catherine really likes Charlie. Are you talking to other girls? Did you talk to your mom about me? Like, oh yeah, she's super duper into this guy. I guess when I had spoken to her, I brought up that I'd mentioned her to my mom and she thought I was trying to, I was making things more serious. March 24th at 1217. Okay. Do you see she texts you and says, you've mentioned me to your mom? Yes. Oh my God, bro, she's down bad. This is not good for Catherine. I can see it plain as day. This girl really liked this man. She really, really likes him. Probably she'd do anything to make him happy. For girls, like if a dude talks to his mom about you, it makes you feel like you're important. Like you must like mean something to him, right? I mean, little did she know that he was mentioning her to his mom because you probably know somebody that can do something. But then she says, that made me so happy. Do you see that you respond, yes? Yes, I do. Do you see that she responds, that made me so happy? Yeah, she, she took it the wrong way. <gasps> Imagine going to jail for him and, and then he says up on the stand, she took it the wrong way. I'm out, I'm out, no disrespect, I'm out. <laughs> I'm giving him everything. I'm telling him everything. You're gonna burn. Dude, this is his defense. Um, this is bad. Yeah, she was she was happy. I mean, she she got overly excited. I, I wasn't expecting that. Was your relationship coming to an end in the summer of 2014? Yes, she, she wanted more and I didn't want anything more. And were you communicating that to friends? Yes, I was. Ooh, dude. Oh, okay. Are they trying to say she was vengeful and she killed her ex-lover's sister's ex-husband to get back at him? I don't know what they're trying to paint here, but this is making Charlie look like an asshole. Even more so if he broke up with her in early 2014 and then commissioned this girl that was clearly in love with him to kill somebody in the summer. This is his defense, dragging him down head under water by the feet. I wanna to talk to you about a dinner on March 11th, 2014, a Yardbird dinner. Oh no, Yardbird. Do you remember whether, you, who was the dinner with? I was, I met Katie uh, down in Miami on Lincoln Road and uh, my sister was in town and I, I was already working down there. I remember I was in my scrubs. And uh, my sister came and she brought uh, the, boy, the guy that she just started dating, who was uh, Jeff Lacoste. Do you recall where you sat? Yeah, we, we sat outside the restaurant. There was a, a few tables set up on the sidewalk. What happened at And uh, it was the four of us sitting there. Did you know that you were being watched? No, not at all. Did you know that Sigfredo Garcia was thinking about killing you that night? 
No. Not oh at all. my god. His defense is that Catherine was obsessed with him and she got her friends to mess with his family. That's totally their defense. Well, this is embarrassing. Now this is March 11th, 2014, right? Yes. During the dinner, do you recall discussions about ex-husbands between your sister and Catherine McVanua? Yes, I do. Do you recall who initiated those discussions? No, I don't. Do you recall making a bad joke again at that dinner? Yes. And that's the same joke that we've already discussed? Yeah, I do. Now, after the dinner, who came back to your house? My sister and Jeff Lacoste came back to my house. What about Catherine McVanuel? No, she, she went home <coughs> to be with her kids. And was it a normal night when your sister and Jeff Lacoste came back? Yeah, but it's, it's the first time I've ever had, I think, my sister and her boyfriend sleep over my house. So, but it was, it was normal. Is it just me or does the whole family have this same demeanor? Charlie, Wendy, Donna, they all just give off the same exact energy. Like they have a secret that they're all in on together. Did you know anything about a first attempted murder of Professor Markell in early June? No. Now, there's been a lot of talk about birthdays and your dad's birthday and a birthday present. And you may remember some text messages that the state showed during their case regarding wanting to talk to your, give me one sec. I'm so uninterested in his defense, but I just want to keep seeing how he throws his own client under the bus. Do you recall the state showing text messages where you're texting with your mom and she tells you that she can't talk right now, um, that she'll call you when she's alone, she's driving back and she's at a stop in, in Gainesville? and to erase the text message. Oh. Yeah. Mama may never told me to delete no text messages. The defense said that? I mean, I guess he had to get it out of the way, but come on, bro. Who was your mom with at that stop at Gainesville? She was with my dad, so she didn't want to talk in front of him. And why didn't she want to talk in front of him? Because it was a surprise. We, originally, we were thinking no. about doing a cruise. No, what I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that for a second. Even if my mom was trying to plan something for my dad, why would she tell Charlie to delete messages on his phone? That does not make any sense. I'm calling BS on that. This is un real you know what i have no choice if the defense is this bad in dragging him down slowly i have to watch the cross-examination but that means we're gonna have to continue it in another video